Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Mandrill, the best way to send transactional email from the people who make MailChimp. Sign up today at mandrill.com. And by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique corporate law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. For more information, visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Yes, we're here at All Things D, and uh, what an amazing conference it is, and great speakers. But my favorite part of coming to All Things D are the small projects, uh, the new stuff, the hardware in some cases, the founders who are making things that five years from now um, will become groundbreaking and change the world or fail. That's typically how it goes. Seven out of ten of these startups fail. But that's what we do here on the program. We talk about being entrepreneurs. We talk about being founders. We talk about putting a dent in the universe. Uh, as Steve Jobs talked about, who um, spoke at this event here, the All Things uh, Digital event, many times. And I've seen him here um, most famously with Bill Gates. What a great uh, – you can look that up, All Things D. Gates and Jobs. You'll see a great interview. Um, and today, Alex Hawkinson is going to talk to us about – um, Smart Things, which is his startup, which raised over a million dollars on Kickstarter, and it's going to be an amazing episode. Let me just stop for a quick sponsor message, and we'll be right back. Ah, uh, this is a great, great commercial for me to read because it's again a product I use. Mandrill, Mandrill, Mandrill is transactional email from the fine folks over at Mailchimp, <laughs> and they have servers all over the world, so delivery is instantaneous everywhere. Real-time analytics make it really easy to use. iOS, Android, you can see the performance of your apps. And one of the things they do is that's totally, totally genius is A/B split testing, and they're the first transactional email people to do this. What that means is. You don't know if, you know, this headline is going to get a better open rate than this one. So as you send out those transactional emails, it tests them. <clears throat> if one of them works, they go ahead and use it. It's fantastic. And um, transactional email, if you don't know, those are all the lifeblood of your website, uh, your password reset, right? If you get the password reset wrong, you know what people are going to do? They're going to move on and go on to the next site. You've got to get in their inbox when you have a password reset, when you have a friend request, when you have a message waiting for you, uh, or a new feature, any of those things, right? Those transactional emails that are going 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you can't be building that software to do it. And if you use your own uh, servers, you're not going to get in the inbox. I mean, these filters are so sensitive today. You know this. How many times do you see things in your Gmail spam filter, your AOL or Yahoo spam filters that you're like, what is going on here? This is not spam. Well, you need a partner like Mandrill to make sure you get in there, and pricing is incredible. The first 12,000 emails a month are, wait for it, free. That's awesome. Uh, and after that, you pay on a usage basis. You never pay for more than you use, right? There's other people out there. I don't want to mention names, but they are charging you thousands of dollars a month. And if you don't use it for a month or two, you're still on the hook. And they want you to sign these long-term deals. Nope, not Mandrill. Mandrill will pay. You only pay for what you use. Sign up for Mandrill at Mandrill.com. M-A-N-D-R-I-L. Just think two words, man and a drill. Man using a drill. Mandrill. Okay? Mandrill.com and Mandrill app on Twitter. Uh, we're using it over here at the uh, Launch Hackathon. So every time you sign up for the Launch Hackathon, you're going to, you know, you get your emails. Uh, you're going to be getting transactional email from our friends at Mandrill App. Thanks again for sponsoring This Week in Startups. We really, truly appreciate it. Let's get back to this awesome episode. Thanks again to our sponsors. And uh, hey, Alex, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Uh, so the Internet of Things, we've heard about this for a while, years and years and years. But you yeah. actually decided to productize the Internet of Things. And uh, this is the product here. But before we get into the product, how would you describe this concept of the Internet of Things? When did you first start hearing that buzzword? You know, for me, it, uh, I wasn't aware of the bu buzzwords. I think it sort of started as a meme before it was, I was conscious to it. Yeah. It started with a personal problem. You know, I, I have a, my family has a little mountain house. And uh, a couple of years ago, we arrived, and it was all flooded and frozen over. And started with this a personal project. I wanted to install a sensor that would let us know that that had happened again in the future yeah. before it became a big Not issue. Not prevent it, but yeah. just at least let you know. Let it know. So called, <laughs> called the guy two, two miles down the road that could have solved a $50,000 ah, yeah. problem for us. So it started with a personal issue, and as I dug in, um, you know, realized what a big opportunity it is that, you know, there's uh, this hardware renaissance going on right now, and sort of every object that can be connected will be. And I think we sense it in things like Nest and Fitbit and other things, and that there's this 
a massive diversity of new connected things in our everyday lives that are arising, and sort of the implications of that are pretty profound. And, and you mentioned a couple there, Nest uh, doing um, thermostats, so yep. you can take out your iPhone and you can see what the temperature is in your house. You have Dropcam doing cameras, you yeah. can see what's going on Great in your example. house. And uh, I think even for pools, I was talking to my pool guy today, and he said, for $2,000, you can see what temperature your pool is on your phone. I said, yeah, I think for $2,000, I'm going to dip my foot in the pool and find <laughs> out when I get yeah. home. But yeah. Yeah. This is all being driven by the smartphone or by circuits that are small enough to put Wi-Fi uh, into devices? What, what's driving this? I think, um, you know, there's been, of course, efforts around sort of building control and automation and home automation and things like that for a little while. And none of them have really taken off. But I think that what's different now is is a few things. And the biggest one is the smartphone revolution. I mean, I think that you never would have dialed into your dial-up account and waited to hear your front doorbell ring and wait to open the door from your computer. It's just not right. practical, you know, versus you're carrying now the perfect sort of access point for this. I think of it as the physical graph, you know, that's arising mm. and you want to have it all at your fingertips. And it's both the tool, but also the mentality it creates. You know, if, if you're a user of a smartphone, the typical curve is within a couple of months, it's sort of the remote control for your life, your media and your communications and your banking and yes, your life. And so when people see, what we're doing and some of these things now they sort of have an expectation mentally that mm -hmm. their their stuff should be connected in the same way and so right. that's the biggest there's some other technical trends you know hardware cheaper to hard manufacture and prototype new hardware things like 3d printing and other things that are making it accelerate faster better radios moore's law and cheaper chips right that all makes it easier but i think the biggest one is sort of the smartphone is the bow wave so you have this idea that there has to be a central hub and a platform for the devices to talk to each other. Nobody had really done much work on that. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, we a hub wasn't a part of our vision, and it's even even long term. It's not that you necessarily need a hub. I'll, I'll describe that in a second. But we came to see that there needs to be, just like people were publishing websites, and Google didn't exist yet, and it mm -hmm. sort of took a Google to put it at your fingertips and right. form the knowledge graph. You know, and then their people were online, but it took platforms like Facebook and Twitter to sort of create the social graph and all the ramifications. With the physical stuff, it's similar. There needs to be a connective platform that right. lets it all talk to each other to really let the cool stuff unfold, right? right? And so what we saw was this proliferation of lots of people creating connected devices, but it makes sense for them all to talk together. If you'd mm -hmm. have a central security mechanism, you know, application platform, things like that. And so that's what we decided to go after is that sort of central opportunity. In terms of technology... Uh, yes, we produce in our kits today a, a hub. It turned out there was a bunch of existing standards where to make it go faster for users and make it easier for people to get going quickly, we decided to build one device, which you have one in a house or a building, and it has basically a lot of those standards in it. So it's the sub device. I've actually got one in here. Yeah, let's take a look at it. So could show you a quick sense of it. But this, uh, it's really simple. There's no button. It's like a Wi-Fi hub. Yeah, there's no buttons on it or Light anything. It, it's got uh, Zigbee, Z-Wave. It can talk to... Uh, Zigbee and Z-Wave. So you got to uh, stop right there. Okay. What's Zigbee? What's Z-Wave? Wi-Fi, Z -Wave? of course. Uh, there's existing standards for sensor networks and home control and automation, building control and things like that. And so... That's by, Zigbee? That's Zigbee. Z-Wave's another one. It's a more proprietary protocol, but there's a lot of uh, existing products. Zigbee and Z-Wave, who made those? And when, how long have they been around? Uh, Z-Wave has been around for, they've both been around sort of 10-ish ten, years or something, mm. and they've been maturing. They're both low-power mesh networking standards. Consumers don't care about this stuff, so we've made yeah, it no, invisible, but, but underlying yeah. technology, uh, you know, it's, they're the things Low that power is you, important, so the devices... But you have a battery-powered yeah, device yeah. with a huge range, you know, it can talk to other devices to mesh its signal, so you can get a much bigger range through ah. construction materials, and sort of run on a battery for a couple of years with you know, sending data regularly and stuff like that. It would be an example of out. one of the devices that would connect over that mesh network, over yeah. Zigbee. So Zigbee, we, you said, is not the standard? Zigbee, yeah. Zigbee is an open standard. There's mm. lots of chip manufacturers. Z-Wave's mm. similar. It's got a lower range, but it's only one chip manufacturer, but there's a lot of products out. So you, the hub acts as a, a sort of a, a router for sure. all of those networks simultaneously, and there's about a thousand device types that can work with smart things already. And what so would be the top like, five that people would be interested in? You know, in? things that you're used to in your life today. So a switch that you can turn on and off that you can put in your wall. And it looks like a regular switch, but it's, it can also be controlled over the, the platform. Okay, uh, so I could plug switch. in a coffee machine 
into the plug and then yeah. have the plug and the power yep. and so then there's... flip that plug, just toggle that plug on and off to make exactly. it a coffee. And then there's in-wall switches and dimmers, there's locks, there's ah. thermostats, there's shade controls, there's sensors of all kinds, so sense mm. motion and light and whether something's open or shut or if it moved, things like that. So a lot so, of those, like when you yeah. see somebody who's got a fancy rich house yeah. that's modern yeah. and they have those dimmers and those rheostats, those are connected over Zigbee over the mesh network in some cases. You can buy those controllers. They are. So there's some, some sort of proprietary names that you hear out there that are actually using some of these standards underneath their devices. Ah. And they tended to, uh, so yes, so in some of those systems, it's using some of these same technologies. Yeah. You know, and we're sort of piggybacking on some of that. Uh, where they've been different is they've tended to use a local controller that's sort ah. of bolted down. It's got a terrible interface. It's a keypad. It doesn't have much march or processing in it. And uh, the sort of the one of the differences for us, and I'll get into more of that later yeah. if you want, but is it connects it all up to the cloud, and you have all the computing power of the internet and sort of an application platform, all the things you can do right. that are sort of open up the possibilities in a much wider range. But, right. So yeah. then by getting to the cloud, I could look at my lights when I... I'm not in my home in Colorado and say, oh my God, did I leave the lights on? Or do I want to put the lights on to make it seem like somebody's home? Yeah, or you, exactly. You could sort of, certainly we have a mobile app and you can control everything from anywhere, but you can also write really sophisticated, simple to sophisticated apps in the cloud mm -hmm. that will control this stuff. So Almost like scripts, you would say? Yeah, you could say like scripts. Like a Word, Microsoft Word macro almost. They can be very simple. You know, if my front door opens while I'm not there, then send me a notification, right? Okay, that's pretty simple, um, yeah. If, if I then. am there and the front door opens, turn on the lights because I'm coming, I'm arriving home, right? Great, yeah. Or something. But they can go much deeper like algorithmic learning. So uh, let's say, uh, you know, something that recognizes the patterns of you being home and when you're away, let's say you want to make it look like you're home. Yeah. For security reasons, it could actually turn on your lights and sort of a, a, a sequence Walking around the house. As yeah. though you're there. You Turning know, the and TV so on. on. And many, many other things, of course. Yeah. But the implications, as you think about it, is you connect up the everyday world and you know everything that's going on in the physical world. You can sort of touch every facet of life with this right. much more powerful software. And that's what's, that's what what's really remarkable so know, what else this. comes in the pack here i see uh yeah so you, you the way we start is we we sort of try to set talk try about this thing in here Ugh. uh sort of 10 minutes and 200 dollars. so yep. you start with the kickstarter base is a very wide open community they had you know two thousand suggestions for what they wanted to do with the platform right uh going forward you'll see these basically vertical solutions on the platform what will say like here's the less worry kit here's the home security kit here's the lighting kit ah and you'll start with something you want to do specifically. And then this, these kits, uh, again, are very inexpensive. They basically, there's a card in it that says, go to the mobile app. Yep. The mobile simple. app guides you on 100% of, they're, they're sturdy, so don't worry yeah. about it. Uh, the mobile app guides you through 100% of everything. You sort of plug in your hub. Then it contains, depending on what scenario you've got, it contains yeah. things, which are disconnected devices mm -hmm. that know how to talk to our cloud. What's this I, thing? That's a person in room sensor. So it can set, ah. you can set it on a shelf somewhere. Um, like you know, like this, or hang it on a nail on the wall, and mm -hmm. it can tell if if there's a living person or pet or something present in an environment. As wow. an example, this is a is missing its keychain ring, but it's uh, which I could put on, but it's a presence tag. Your phone ah. can work as a tag, but you could throw it in a kid's backpack or on a dog ah. collar, in your glove compartment of your car. So that so if kid in driveway, send an alert, <laughs> or right, if dog. Right. If I leave the if, compound, yeah, without you being there, uh, I'd send you a notification. Or if I drive away in my car, shut the garage door automatically for the appropriate uh -huh. car. And uh, when I come home, sort of open it back up wow. and set the thermostat appropriately and so on. So uh, inside here, there's lots of other uh, things kind of buried in the kits. So like I said, there's, there's more than a power a thousand adapters, yeah. connected. Uh, device types that work with the platform now. This is a camera. Uh, ah, wow, look at that. Little tiny uh, ping camera. Coming, uh, coming, coming out. There's a. It's an example of a, a moisture sensor. You can ah, sort of drop put it on that the in basement the basement. Yeah. That solve my problems. Or a put it in the ago. kid's bedroom to make sure there's not mold or something like that. You could give somebody an alert. Exactly. There's. Uh, there's or put it under the house because mold is a big issue in homes. It's very dangerous. You could drop Black them all. Mold. Drop them all over the place. These things. I are went very, through this with the mold thing. Very inexpensive. Yeah. This is a. What we call the smart sense multi it's it knows you glue it on a garage or, or cabinet or a gar you know something mm -hmm. and it knows if it's open or shut oh yeah that's like what adt would charge you like ten thousand dollars to install around your house right what does that and unit cost if we want to buy 10 of those what are they a dollar each ten dollars each they're getting cheaper i mean morris law is in charge here so these the average things cost sort of 20 to 40 dollars a piece oh, but super then there's no cheap. ongoing yeah fee or anything like that you're not getting slaughtered by adt and every a lot day. of these things have a very high range and they also has this as an example uh 
a three axis accelerometer. You can put it on a garage door and it can know if it's open or shut by the angle. Ah. Throw one in a gun case. Not that I own a gun, but I know if it moved because it's got a vibration sensor. It's got a temperature sensor and a lot of these other capabilities. I own a gun. So, yeah, I put that on my gun case. <laughs> think of it. Think of it as no. It's as, actually a really amazing idea. Like if you do a have case, like, a chemical cabinet, if you have kids, you know. No, this is. Any, a, I mean, anything. if you. I mean probably the majority of Americans own a gun or like some large number of them. A lot and, do. And, and if you, you have a gun safe, yeah. knowing the gun safe was opened is a critically important thing. We're putting aside exactly. our judgments as exactly. liberal intellectuals. Well, you're getting to some point, some point, which is these kits, basically, how you get started is they will come and they say they have the hub and these connected things. But then in our mobile app, there's basically a whole catalog, and you, you know, the viewers won't necessarily see this, but a yeah, we'll cut it in a yeah. catalog of of apps which mm. now are built by an open developer community in our platform that say, let's start with a little if then if this then that yeah. this type of scenario. So if the can the developers make money by selling those apps, or are they just doing it for like the good of the community right now? Is it like in the early stages, Ruby it's gems, open, or is open it open and for the good of the community? But they are polished apps, and so we will be rolling out sort of a, a way for developers to monetize. Uh, yeah, that'd those be great. Within the platform, so just like an app store, like can program. they become like hardware? Can they become combination hardware and yep. software developers? So I say, exactly. gosh, yep. I, you know, I want I have cattle. You know, or I, because some people That's do have farms, right? Like, example, yeah. And they want to just say, like, hey, I just, I want to know where all, I have a friend who's got horses in, you know, in um, Los Angeles. They would <laughs> love on their farm, they probably have 50 different yeah, animals. They totally. would love to put sensors on the animals to just know if one gets out. Uh, there's, uh, you know, part of the power of the open platform is, of course, you know, we're seeing it adjust. So it makes it very easy to say, you know, of course, when I pull up the flood sensor, it's already got notifications built in, and that's an app running and so on. Or imagine that this, uh, same open shut sensor, you know, when you're home, it can be used for convenience, turn on the lights, you know, when it's mm -hmm. dark outside and you're, you're opening a door. Uh, but when you're not there, it can be used for security. If a grandma's at home alone, it can be used in elder care. You know, all these different scenarios come possible with the apps that people are writing. And so you should ask me what some of the most unexpected things are. But it's, yeah, of course, so, all, the uh, all the predictable Alex, things. Alex, what are, are some of the most unexpected things that have been uh, released <laughs> on the platform? <laughs> yeah, you, you mean, you get all of the key things that everybody can identify sex. with, like security and so on. There's a bedroom optimizer app. I was about uh, to say, because you know sex is good. There's already people <laughs> doing all kinds of sex stuff with these Internet of Things. If you want two but, sex examples, I can give you two. You know, oh, yeah, give us two sex examples. Yeah, right, yeah. So there's, I mean, there's, keep it PG-13. There's the more mundane. I, I will say that some sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> you can connect web service to these, these things as well. And so there's, there's a couple of porn sites that have built a, a desktop plugin that will change what's on your screen when the door opens or somebody else arrives home when you <laughs> Oh, really? That's an Fantastic. Example. Okay. That's maybe a great that example. There's the bedroom optimizer app which we jokingly call it but it's uh for parents with young kids so it's friday night and it's after 9 p.m and the kids are in bed and the lights are off and there's no motion in the kids rooms then put on okay the put on the berry white on the sun house and dim the, the parents lights and can have some time yeah. together time together exactly mom and dad time together time <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly without a yeah uh, childhood scarring but, moment <laughs> yes yeah. so you see you see these uh you know yes that but you see these playful examples in fitness and in and health in entertainment, mm. in gaming, sort of gamification Why of the world. Why is it yeah, taken so long for this to become reality? Because living in Los Angeles, like people are obsessed with their homes. I like, mean, California yeah. in general, we have this home obsession. Yeah. And I have all these friends who put in this stupid Questron system. They spent hundreds of this is the, their lives. They spent two yeah. or three hundred thousand dollars putting in the system, the stupid Questron into their house. Yeah. And they want to adjust the light setting. And, and then they're like, hey, look at this. They, they pick up this big brick and they go, watch, <laughs> I'm going to turn the lights. And then the lights go up and down. You go, wow, that's good. I'm going to open the curtains. They go open the curtains. And they go, yeah. now I'm going to try to watch the Nick game. They press the button and it's like, source doesn't work. And like, no, no, I, I'm going to watch the Nick game. <laughs> and I'm going to put on Dolby and I'm going to play yeah. Blu ray. And nothing right. works. And then right. they call a guy for $100 an hour, $200 yeah. an hour to yeah. come and teach them how to put a DVD on. Yeah. And I'm like, I got a Blu-ray player with Netflix hooked directly up to my TV, I think and that, it just works. I think that things have just, you know, there's a time for everything, and I think that a lot of the technologies have matured. You know, again, I said, like, smartphones didn't exist when a lot of these yeah. companies were founded. I mean, 90% of them. And that, sort that of changes true. everything. You know, you have this in your hand. Cloud platforms weren't as mature. So an open mm -hmm. platform, you know. Uh, application developers being used to building lightweight software. These apps, like the app stores, didn't right. exist. And so but this, you decided yeah, not so. to make it proprietary and not to just absolutely um, 
abuse the customer base. You went with a different philosophy. Absolutely. I mean, I think... Because that's the question people do. They just lock people into the system. You're saying, don't lock anybody into the system. We Let are... a thousand flowers bloom. How do you make money then? We are open, open top to bottom. So, I mean, our, our sort of organizing theme for the company is making the world smarter together is what we think there's an opportunity. Ah. So, to bring together users, developers, and inventors of new connected devices and make it possible for so then how do you how do you guys ultimately make money yeah so we uh there's a there's there's a couple a couple of pathways one is uh basically e-commerce so we're making it very easy to discover these new scenarios we're creating a marketplace mm. for both connected devices and for new apps so in the platform you can discover in this and you know as you're bouncing around you've gotten your kit and it'll say gee you know for you uh here's a this would be great. Maybe you want to know when the mail arrives when you get home. A simple example might be personalized to you or the right. uh, the cattle management because it knows you well, have listen, cattle. If it knows and you live on a farm, and it then it might say, hey, if the mailbox I, is half a mile down the road, you, that actually I, might be a great sensor for you. I kid you not. There's people building chicken coop management systems and stuff on the platform I, now. You know, but, it's funny so, you say that. I'm thinking about getting chickens for my house in Brentwood. So this, people, that's a big the rage. The open yeah. platform lets you get into these – all these places that a closed platform can never get you, right? right. And so there's going to be places for some some closed systems, but well, people you know, be able to is, write the reviews, like and say, like honestly, like this yeah. chicken coop system sucks, but yep. this chicken coop system this one's is great. great. Yeah, exactly. four and a half stars. Like, so basically, yeah. you're making the app store. Yes. So we're sort of creating a marketplace where we will, you know, you get a little bit of money, but we're mostly selling at these costs, the the initial stuff, and then it's sort of make it if people if developers build great apps mm -hmm. and some are free. If some are paid for, we'll take a slice of the revenue take from Take 30% those. standard apps. Split. It's going to be a little bit less because we sort of want to less. Make, make room in the case for, you know, call it the Apple tax and other things like that. You sort of can't absorb everything ah. in the ecosystem initially. But there's a lot of there's a oh, lot of opportunity. If, you charge for, if Apple charges for the app and then you're 30% yep. so there. So we have to, and... there's a deeper nuance there that I could talk about, but it's yeah. uh, so we're thinking through. But we want to make sure that the developers get a huge slice of it, yeah. obviously, but... Uh, there's connected services people can build. So imagine not just the, not just the uh, the app, but imagine a emergency plumber repair service on that moisture sensor, where you pay not just to sort of net notified, but guaranteed that a plumber will show up within two hours if it. Oh gets wow! Right. So you now you're making like bottom up ADTs. Exactly. There's a interesting wow. Uber of off duty cops is one of my favorite examples where oh, a that's local so genius. cop with a, a gun and a badge that's off time knows your neighborhood. When you're away on vacation, you don't even have to install it on a contract. You just say this service should run for the two weeks I'm away from my wow. house. And, and I'll just pay ten bucks a day for you to be on for that call or to whatever it is. Right, yeah. exactly. Let the marketplace unfold. And so we're we're trying to create that mechanism and we'll take a slice of that revenue. That so that's, is that's, so that's the primary brilliant. When we get back Thank you. Yeah. So brilliant! I mean, you're combining creates a lot of opportunity for a lot of people. App store with a f with a with hardware, with apps, and with a service. Um, that's a trifecta that I think is going to be very powerful uh, if people can actually pull it together and execute. When we get back from this important commercial break, I want you. This is a little teaser in the radio biz. Okay. <laughs> um, and oh yeah, I'm supposed to like. This is like the other thing. I'm trying to learn how to be like a professional radio host. So I'm supposed to say, uh, hey everybody, you're listening to this week in startups. Uh, I have Alex Hawkinson on the program of Smart Things, the founder and CEO of Smart Things. You can follow him on Twitter, <laughs> at A. Hawkinson. It's like, it's like NPR yeah. or something. Yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> when we get back from the commercial break, um, I'm, I want you to talk about how you raised over a million dollars on Kickstarter. There's only Happy like, yeah. there's under 100 people who have done that, maybe under 50 who've done that. Yeah. And um, what that day was like when you woke up and all of a sudden, you know, or did you even sleep when this thing is like going to hundred? <laughs> we saw it when it went over. <laughs> yeah, we didn't wake so up. So I want I want to I want to start with yeah. that moment when we get back okay. from this very important Perfect. message. What a great episode we're having, and I want to take a moment to thank Scott Ed Walker of the Walker Corporate Law Group. He is a boutique. Uh, he has a boutique law firm that specializes in founders and startups. I know a lot of founders have used him. He's awesome, and he believes in fixed fee. Pricing. What that means is you're not going to get that PDF every month from your attorney that you open up and it's like, okay, I could be in for $600, $6,000, or $60,000. You're going to know what your bill is going to be. And as an example of that, he worked with their client, Mighty Text, uh, which got a great write-up in TechCrunch, by the way. And they engaged Walker Corporate Law for their $2,900 all-you-can-eat startup package, then used them for their seed financing, and then for their stock option plan. Additional services include mergers and acquisitions, licensing agreements, and terms of service and privacy policies. If you want to talk to the founder, Scott Ed Walker, call him directly, 415-979-9998. 415-979-9998. 
uh, Scott's a great guy. I know him. He's been a tireless supporter of entrepreneurs and founders. He's at every event we do. And, you know, he takes on folks who are very early in their career, and he grows with them. I really appreciate him. Uh, and the attorneys who work with him all have 10, 20 years working at those big firms with those big expensive offices. Now they're in cheaper offices, and they're just, like, grinding it out like the rest of us, building great startup businesses. Uh, thank you, at Scott Ed Walker. You have been great to the program, such a loyal supporter of This Week in Startups and the Launch Festival. Um, and, you know, uh, you can email him directly, scott at Walker Corporate Law. We will um, all thank you at Scott Ed Walker on Twitter. And let's get back to this awesome episode. All right, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. Alex Hawkinson is my guest. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of Smart Things. You can find Smart Things at, I'm assuming, smartthings.com. Smartthings.com, yeah. Very good. And, uh, boy, has he been on a tear. Also follow at Smart Things on Twitter. We've been talking about uh, this great hardware package. This is a $200 package? Yep. Starter package, 200 bucks. You decided to do a Kickstarter project, and it hit over a million dollars. Why did you do the Kickstarter project, and, and what do you think it takes to, to do something as successful as you did? I mean, there's a lot, a lot there, so I'd love to talk about it. Yeah, it's, let's go through I think it. it's one of the great things that's happening is sort of direct connection with innovation and consumers that want to support it. So, you know, for us, we made the choice early on to be an open platform, mm -hmm. and we knew where we were building the platform regardless. So we right. had a working prototype, you know, at the Kickstarter phase and so on. But being an open platform that we're trying to get in consumers, developers that want to build apps, and device makers that want to invent new connected things mm -hmm. and bring them all together in one spot, you know, we just, there's no way with a private beta or something, how do you do that, right? Mm -hmm. So for us, Kickstarter was uh, this, we had this woke up, literally woke up one morning, I think it was in June before the campaign and just thought, gosh, you know, that what a perfect way to sort of put it out there. And the risk is nobody likes it. They tell mm -hmm. you fast. That's a, that's a good thing. Uh, but, you know, what a great way to build a community and sort of see if people engage around the idea and get their feedback into the product and so on. So we started, the goal was much lower financially. We thought maybe we'll get a 1,000 people and 100 developers will sign up and really enthusiastic people, and that'll be awesome, you know. Right. And, um, so it was all about community engagement. Obviously, we put it up there, and um, we were worried... You know, I would recommend simple messages to most Kickstarter campaigns. Of course, ours was, I think, pretty complicated because we told Very a platform story. Yeah. And if you watch the vision, it's still uh, the video is still indicative of our vision. You know, but it's consumers. We make it easy to use. Developers, you can build apps. Makers, you can make new things. It's like a lot to absorb in four minutes. And uh, so we uh, we were obviously really pleased when you know, I think our initial goal was 250,000. We debated that internally if that was too high and, you know, and so on. And what if we don't tip? Oh God. <laughs> you know? Yeah. What and, if we uh, hit 200? Like we blew by, by that in a couple of days. So, uh, it was. Who picked it up first? I mean, cause I, from what I've heard getting press yeah. about, about your Kickstarter project. So I just went through this with, um, space monkey, which is an investment in somebody right. who launched at, and who also from Colorado. Right. Um, who launched at the launch festival, um, they had a tremendous Kickstarter and they said press, press, press is so yeah. important. Influencer medium media influencers as well. Yeah. Did you have a big press strategy? We we had a, a little bit of an outreach. I mean we've started other companies in the past, so we have a pretty good network. I think that mm -hmm. was very useful. We teed it up in advance, lots of friends and family, all the things to sort of get your network engaged so you get that early window of users that start to go. And how do you do that? You just you're just begging people on email like, hey, please go buy this and tweet it? Kickstarter, once they approve your project, you can literally hold on to it and give people the private link. And so we were exposing <coughs> people in our network to the video and saying, uh -huh. hey, this is coming. We really hope, do you, what do you like? If you like it, please support it. So they can so support on. it before it launches. They can be ready. They can't bid or, or back it, but they can be ready when it goes. So, Got it. So we had a nice little initial burst, but that only carries you through, I mean, people digging into their wallets, the yeah. first few tens of thousands of dollars or something. What did but you think was the most important tipping point? Is it a Reddit story? Was it a Hacker News story? Was we, it a tweet from somebody like Scoble? We got a good pickup from Mashable uh, early on. Uh, and then also a sort of an instrumental moment was uh, one of our seed investors, David Tish. He's an incredible guy. David Tish, uh, formerly of Techstars New York. Yeah. And he's just Great angel investor. Phenomenal. I couldn't, couldn't say anything but positive things about him. And he... Uh, he really cares. He really cares. He, he got the vision. And he and a few others sort of pointed folks like CNN uh, to us. And oh, so wow. we... We had uh, uh, smart people catch on to the idea, share it with others, and then you know we had a few of those big bursts of press, and that really helped a lot. Um, on top of that, though, I'd say maybe we would have done a third of our goal uh, mm -hmm. or, or the, our total 
uh, with with that. It was all about community engagement then. I mean, I think oh, what... explain that. Unpack what does community engagement mean when doing a Kickstarter? And I, there's a downside to it, too. I think it's why a lot of Kickstarter projects fail. Okay. Um, so it's... When you have these early people that reach out and they're going to put their money on the table to back you, you have to be really authentic and answer their questions and right. sort of what they're envisioning. Hey, how are you imagining using this? And that doesn't come after you ship. That comes right. R why did you? What was interesting to you about this? And answering their questions. So we and had, that's on that message board tab or something, right? Exactly. So we had, you know, one example of that was we put out a, a wouldn't it be smart if post and asked people to contribute their ideas for what they were going to do with the platform. And we offered a special reward. We'd give them an extra thing ah. in order to respond to that. And we had 2,000 suggestions in one day. Of course, it had a great economic incentive for them. But just that, that back and forth with the community at every stage. So basically, it was a full-time job for four people through the entire month for us wow. just managing the communications. Because we had hundreds of comments uh, per day, lots of them very deep, you know, ups and, and downs and so on. And when you're spending... 40 hours a day. I'm assuming these people did it for eight, nine, ten hours a day. Yeah. So when you're doing 40 hours a day of community engagement, <laughs> those people become, I'm guessing, very deeply involved in the project, and then they become amplifiers. Exactly. So I think that that's why it's, I think the press gets you so far, but literally I think sort of two-thirds of the volume is probably from that, mm -hmm. from the early enthusiasts that found you, and then they sort of tell others about it. And we, we kept going with special rewards to sort of stretch goals along yeah. the way, which really authentically weren't in our vision in the beginning. But as we started going out there, we said, well, what do you want? Well, gee, if we get this higher volume, we can achieve that, we think. Right. So, uh, you know, on the downside of that, just to unpack that piece of it, it's that I think a lot of these Kickstarter projects are two guys and, a, and an idea, right? They right. don't have the working prototype yet for real. Mm -hmm. And they put it out there and then that level of community engagement just crushes them. So they literally make no progress on the actual building during uh, the month. So that 40 hours a day, they've got only 20 hours a day to put to it. So they're underwater. They're underwater. They're not building it. So they're already behind from oh. what they expected when they jumped in. So they didn't forecast the community engagement and sort of makes their own nightmare that if they flip back, if they're really small, they also may not have enough energy just to respond to folks. And, you know... There's a lot of, I mean, you have to have a good idea and things too, right? You can't, <laughs> you have to have a lot of things, you know, going the wind behind your backs. But we've seen a lot of people with good ideas not be successful. And I think it has, comes down to some of those, those parameters. You um, raised $3 million in seed funding um, just this last, uh, over the last holiday from great people. Yuri Milner, amazing. David Tish, amazing. Crunch Fund, Chris Dixon, Max Levchin. Um, Ryan First round, let it, yep. Wow. I yeah, mean, it's just like an all-star. Ryan Sarver is uh, from Twitter, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, just an amazing, Luik, uh, fantastic entrepreneur. Martin, uh, just great people. Aaron Levy, wow. Yeah, I um, think we have some of the best seed investors in the world. So how, did, um, how did you get that done? Were, were those people, do you, do you think those people were fans of the product and wanted to use it? Do you think the Kickstarter success made it easier for them to invest? I think... Uh, or just your spectacular leadership <laughs> as an entrepreneur. <laughs> as an entrepreneur. Certainly, what was that it? last piece is the most <laughs> yes. important. No, the, uh, Putting that aside. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, Kickstarter doesn't hurt. That that obviously gives you a lot of this visibility, you know, yeah. uh, to it. So that, that certainly the, sort of opens the door. Did the VCs and the entrepreneurs come to you cold after seeing the Mashable and the um, Kickstarter? Did they say, like, hey, I saw you raised a million on Kickstarter. What could you do with three million more? A little bit. I like that. I mean, some of it, some inbound inquiries, right? That's and then great. There's, of course, a network between them, and they talk to each other and so on. But, I mean, what I'm struck with is just the power of a, a big idea. You know, I'm at the point in my career where I feel like I've spent burn time solving the wrong problems in the past and still built a decent business. But right. this was the one where we as a team, we founded two other businesses together. We're like, what is the biggest most interesting problem we could possibly add value to. And, Why uh, is it important, though, as an entrepreneur to go after something big? I mean, you talked about your previous two, I'm assuming, yeah. wins, yep. but they were smaller wins, yep. Yep. and you made a mistake there, and now you're older and wiser and you want to go bigger. Why is that important? It wasn't a mistake uh, in that it, I mean, it certainly worked out, you know, and, and I'm a very lucky guy. You know, I have a, a I'm, you know, economically sound and, and other things from these things. So it's, you got rich from the other startups, okay? Uh, uh, reasonably, and and I, you know, I'm fortunate. And Enough it to wasn't do fifty thousand dollars worth of damage to your Colorado home and <laughs> recover from it. From it. And yeah, recover so, from it. And if you read this month's Wired, you know, sort of describe my house and so on. And it, uh, but the, 
you know, I've been I've been fortunate, so I don't want to say they're mistakes, but I, I just think the power of focusing on, you know, a lot of businesses is like pushing a rock up a hill. You know, it's all your willpower and all your talent. And you know, what we found with this is this it's such a profound opportunity that mm. sort of really smart people will get behind it more readily and really give you their support in a way that's I haven't seen in any other businesses that I've been engaged engaged in. So. You know, we, for us, we, we were fortunate. We sort of caught people's imaginations, I think, with Kickstarter. We've been around the block as a team. They saw that we could sort of execute. Mm. Uh, and then as they started to stack up, they all wanted in, of course. So it was, it was a great, and they've been very valuable to but us But defining well. a great mission, from what I'm hearing from you, it makes everything actually easier. If you can yeah. find a mission that's big and bold and audacious and yeah. important, everything gets easier? Uh, that's my perspective. I mean, and, and what again, what gets easier? I think that on a tangible basis. Well, uh, a bigger, bigger problem. Some things get harder. <laughs> yeah, let's go through the uh, easy than the hard. Yeah. So uh, I think that it's easier to get the smartest people in the world with the deepest pockets to support a really big idea because Why? small ideas don't move the needle for them. Ah, right, so if life. I'm a rich angel investor and Luis <laughs> made a bunch of money off of a bunch of things, you'd rather have a big impact. Yeah, he doesn't about want to put life. 25 grand or 100 grand into something that's going to make 10 million. He wants a billion dollar company <laughs> as an investment. I don't know, but it's also sort of. I know Luis. I can speak for him. Okay, <laughs> well, yeah, I'll let you do that. But I think it's also meaning and sort of creating meaningful change, ah, right? And so, so that's deeper. It's not that another mobile local social company isn't really great, but uh, you know, it's it's incremental as opposed to something fundamental and. I think that when you go after something really big, you you can you can often get these sort of the deepest investors to sort of go all the way with you. And I think ah. it's hard. There's risks, and I'll get to the hard parts. I think it's also easier in some respects in that there's less competition often. Um, right, you're doing something it's, insane. It's you're doing something insane, and so like who's 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 following you? I mean, I think it's yeah. I can't wait to see Elon Musk down tonight. You know, yeah, exactly. Event. I mean. Go after the big hairy problems, and you know what? The world will support you. Yeah, and it I'm going to go to Mars. It's doable. Yeah, people want to work on those problems. Who's, who's your competition going to Mars? Alon? It makes <laughs> it makes it easier to recruit people that want to ah, support the big problems. Right. So less know? competition, more yeah. investors, better, better talent. Exactly. Go for it. I mean, what's what's the downside? So of course, uh, now the downside. You have to. Yeah, I think it took some building blocks for me to be comfortable taking that risk personally. Uh, uh, you and, had to build up your own wherewithal. And I think if I, when I was younger, there was a lot of mistakes I learned how to overcome, you know, to become a better leader, manager. Uh, what were to, they? What was the big mistake? I mean, you, everybody, entrepreneurs, when they get to your, you're 40 now? I just turned 40, yeah. Okay, so, so when you get to 40, you know what you sucked at when you were in your 20s. <laughs> it's clear, right? Either through therapy yeah. or all the people you talk to telling yeah. you or your executive coach. Yeah. What did you suck at in your 20s? I'll tell you what I sucked at, too. <laughs> <laughs> There's a range like a of things session. that some would argue I probably still suck at them. But what did you suck at most? I mean, I, uh, you know, uh, as an example, recognizing a good business deal. You said, what makes a good partnership? Ah, uh, would be a good example. So seeing the many ways, so things break down in the weeds. I mean, mm. you know, it's not if you have a car and you take one wheel off, it doesn't drive. Mm. I don't care if it's a Tesla, awesome car. Right. Like you're not driving it home. And so the one me whistling wheel, even most of the cars there. And so life is sort of like that in companies. You know, you learn to recognize how you have to get all the things approximately right to have it going at all, right? And I think when I was younger, I didn't recognize how things can utterly fall apart. Yeah. You know, with, with the wrong sort of, you know, you have a great channel partner. They want to sell your product, but they're not going to support it the right way. You know, whatever it, it, it is, yeah. right? And so that's a good example. I think I learned to deal with, uh, pushing the wrong people out of an organization faster. That's a common one you hear. Yes. Dealing with hard personnel You tried problems. to change people as opposed to just getting them off the bus and getting the right people on the bus. Exactly. In so the you, Jim you, Collins kind yeah, of You, sort of, you, you, you become a grown-up you know, in that process. Some people have a very good native ability straight up to do those things, and God bless them, right? Right. But for me, it took a while to sort of figure some yeah. of those things out. So well, I did the yeah. same thing, too, when I was younger. I just always felt like... God, I got to work with people who are just not getting the job done. And then yeah. you realize, like, wait a second, maybe they're not getting the job done yep. for some reason that I'm not capable of changing, at least not in the period of time that I have to make this startup succeed. Exactly. And then don't focus on the wrong problems. I mean, it's another thing where they feel right, but with a great team, even as you get good at building a great team, and our team has been together for a while. I've been with the CTO for 14 years and other stuff, and it's part of what sets us apart is we've been around the block, uh, but and we know how to work together, but... A great team can also make a crappy idea 
pretty successful because you can like apply oh, yeah. your incredible energy to like no you customers you really do want this you know and we're gonna keep it together and so on but uh you know that's this coming back to this idea of of going after the right problem so with a team i was i think i was bad at, at that you know uh-huh. uh, identifying less the good than i am now yeah, now yeah. you suck that, and it's yeah, good I mean, to admit. I, I did when some you good businesses, so but no, yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost like if app, if Steve Jobs got everybody focused on making a rice cooker or a refrigerator, yeah. like that's not or a fax machine. It's like, not going to change the world. It'd be a hell of a fax machine or a rice cooker, but it's not going to change the world. Exactly, you got it. Yeah, so it's a that's very meaningful. very profound uh, lesson. So this is the 1.0 product. Yeah. When did it come out? I mean, I know you did the Kickstarter in September, so I'm assuming it came out in the spring. We started shipping, uh, so we took a little longer than than we ex- we hoped for. We started shipping in in March. Mm-hmm. Um, What's the reaction been like? It's been great. I mean, uh, as as measured by the open web, um, you know, people have been very excited. Uh, I think it's the early adopter community. I think yeah. we have a lot to do to make it even easier mm-hmm. uh, to use. But uh, we've had a great reaction so far. I hope people. I'm sure there's some Kickstarter backers yeah. that will watch the show and give us their feedback as well. But Have they been patient? Because been there has been some uh, issues around Kickstarter yeah. delivering bad products. In fact, or I've ordered shipping. some and I've yeah. had some bad experiences, but I, I kind of chalk it up to I'm just helping somebody get to the dream and buying an alpha product. But pe- do, do people get that? It's an alpha product or do they expect it to be a finished product? I'd say, I mean, it's been great. I, I'd say that there's... 80 plus percent that are, they know they are supporting an idea, not, and and this is not a store Mm -hmm. at that point. And so you have the noisy, I'm not going to call it trolls, but you know, you have the extremists and then you have people that are frustrated, yeah, validly frustrated. And then you have the deep supporters that have been there and are supporting the entrepreneurship and so on. And so they balance each other out as long as you stay engaged in the equation, because those people that know you're engaged and keep trying. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, that, that community engagement continues all the way through execution, right? right. If you're silent, that's the death of you, uh, you know, and uh, because the negatives take over and the folks that are behind you. So we've had that ongoing community engagement throughout, you know, a lot of Kickstarter projects. We set our bar pretty high. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, a lot of Kickstarter projects. Uh, don't have this fit and finish. They show up in a, yeah. a, a manila envelope with some bubble wrap. Yep. No note. Doesn't even, you're trying to remember what you backed, you know, and stuff yeah. like that. And we've tried to set a very high bar for the app experience through the through the platform. And do you think this is a problem for well Kickstarter? I mean, there's a lot of Kickstarter haters out there. I'm not amongst them. But yeah. there is um, a perception that a lot of people don't get that they're backing a dream, not a finished product. They look at it as a yeah. store. Do you yeah. think that's a problem? I mean, I think Kickstarter is, I've got a couple thoughts on that. I mean, I think that it is a problem. Uh, I think Kickstarter is moving away from supporting sort of product development companies in a lot of cases. They're more in the arts and indie stuff, and there's a big money and great stuff in that. It's their yeah. roots. I sh- wholeheartedly, that's great. Uh, but I think they're also, and so they're changing the qualifications. You have to have a working prototype. You can't just show renderings and ah. hope and stuff like that. Um, so they're, they're sort of, changing the bar a bit and changing the focus areas, but they're missing a great opportunity. And I think somebody else will step in to fill the spot. I've seen, of course, Indiegogo and, and a range of others that are sort of stepping in to say, there is this, not arts projects, but new products. You know, mm-hmm. there's a bunch of people that lean forward and they want to see new things built. And you, you know? really need and to be able to take that flower to get the first 15,000 in to make the prototype. It helps everything. Prototype. Just, exactly. So I, I think that there's a big opportunity. I think Kickstarter's leaned away from it to it. Uh, from it to some extent and i um, that's a bummer yeah. yeah from my standpoint for them but but i think somebody else will step in to fill the gap yeah that, so. it's, their success we'll has become so tremendous that yeah. they have a market of the people and so they they're not i think taking full advantage of that but that's their prerogative and their, yeah. their choice you so, know, so when 2.0 comes out yeah do you do, do <laughs> what's that <laughs> what's it gonna do it's gonna be cool well no let's well yeah. i don't want you to yeah i know you yeah. obviously got to keep that for your press and yeah you know and uh, uh, entrepreneur and entrepreneur i don't want you to tip your cards yeah you should save that um but would you do kickstarter again or would you be more inclined as i've seen some people do do a kickstarter like campaign on your own website with the tremendous number of emails and contact information that you currently have that's a great. It, it literally is a debate we have regularly. Yeah, let's talk to because, you about it. Yeah. Well, we have we have more than the reason it's a debate is we have we're trying to enable the inventors and enable developers to create mm-hmm. a new opportunity with us. And if our if all boats rise, great, and that's what we'll share in the revenues and so right. on. Not trying to compete with them. 
but we have a, a huge community of, of inventors that are building new things. This camera is a good example. Mm. Um, this is a working prototype. It's pretty polished, but yeah. it's uh, where some of them want to commercialize it themselves. Some, it's the idea, and the inventor wants to come up with it, and sort of quirky-like, they mm. want somebody else to do it. Got you it. Know? And they have the idea, they want to see it come into being, and they That's want a slice of that. Yeah. And so we have to juggle between those because there's some really great ideas where we're going to support people that want to build new companies. We'll showcase them on our site and help them mm -hmm. integrate and and so on. Um, and then there's this the ones in the middle where it's a, such a great idea and it should come into existence. And should we do that? Or should they you know, do their own Kickstarter for the camera that works with your system? But some people literally don't want that. To do that. They don't want to create a new company. They, they uh, It's a pro side project. So you could them. have... So we a little Kickstarter inside yeah. your homepage. We're thinking we're thinking about that. So we we have a, a funnel and uh, we've got a whole team that's working on this, basically creating a pipeline with that three thousand developers and device makers that have signed up on the platform, sort of helping ah. them curate and sort of decide how we're gonna get the funnel to come to fruition for right. people. And so within that, um, you know, I would definitely consider kiss Kickstarter again. I don't I think that I think they're leaning away from mm -hmm. these types of projects. We've got a big enough base now that I think I'd probably lean towards the pre-order yep. method. The downside on that economically is that you don't get the money until it ships, right? Ah. So in Kickstarter, you're not guaranteed a product. The entrepreneur gets the money mm -hmm. and they can build something. People that have gone down the Locatron pre-order path, if they didn't have venture financing and other stuff right. like that, they sit there and they're like, oh my God, we don't have the money. We can't build the product to get it shipped to uh, charge for the money. Why, why can't you do that? Because it's illegal? Yeah. You have to, if you're charging a credit card up front, it's for a product sale uh, on your individual and site. And so Kickstarter gets away with that because it's, it's a sort donation. Of their terms of service and all yeah. of that stuff, how so it works. So you'd have to replicate yeah. that in a way yourself. Yeah. And yep. But so you could say, hey, 3,000 developers, cameras are an essential piece of the platform. Yeah. Let's kickstart, you know, a 10,000 camera together. run yep. together yep. based on this quirky, like, you know, everybody collaborated and, and, and yep. get that going. We could. Yep. And so you'll see something out of that, a, a lot of that out of us in the coming months. We view our role as we're trying to bring together the developers and the device makers mm -hmm. with the consumers. And mm -hmm. we see cameras are great examples why I have one here. Yeah. We see a lot of those apps. We'll try to help those come into fruition, you know, instead of pushing the community. So it'll be cool. Alex, uh, I'm a huge fan. It's amazing. You're so honest on the show and gave uh, so much great information. Thank you so much. Highly recommend Thank everybody you. check it out. Um, we're, we're, you're hiring people, I'm guessing, for the team, or where you're we at? Are. Yeah. yeah, we're at 41 people now. 41, significant. 35 engineers. It's very technology-centric. 35, centric. where yeah. are you based? We're based in D.C. Uh, and wow. have a dev center in Minneapolis. It's my hometown. And uh, those have been both great Twin places cities, to Twin cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Get the biggest mall in uh, the United States, right, still? <laughs> yes, and a lot of hardworking uh, Nordic people. So, uh, yeah, you know, they got the hamster trails there, right? <laughs> yes. Between the buildings. What does it get, negative 20 and 30 there? It gets cold in the winter. It gets they, really nice in the summer. They literally have hamster trails between the buildings in Minneapolis, right? Yeah, they call right? them you skyways. Can, but yeah, it looks yeah, like yeah, a hamster trail city. <laughs> yeah, and you can do. basically <laughs> walk block to block to block on the third floor of every building. It's cold. They're coping with the weather. But it's uh, so, so we, you have a you have a development team there. Yeah, that's yeah, groovy. So, yeah, it's been you got to look for talent in the places that exist, and for us, uh, so we're headquartered in DC. We have this dev center in Minneapolis as well. We're going to be hiring all over the place. I think eventually. Mm. Uh, right now, a lot of that depends on the ramp economically and our sort of next round of financing, which we haven't announced uh, ah. yet at this point. But well, given but, the uh, given the success right now, it's going to be easy for you to raise money. Um, first name at your domain smartthings.com tends to work for the founder, doesn't it? It does. So yeah. if somebody was an absolutely amazing developer who wanted to join the team, please, yeah, not a bad idea to, to try first name at any founders startup company dot com. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Alex, thanks for uh, being with us. And can I order this still or no? You can. So we're working through the. We've shipped it with, next week. We'll complete shipping to U.S. and Canadian Kickstarter backers. So I think okay. we'll be done, and then we're moving into our pre-orders. Ah. So we've got a wait list of about you know uh, some number of many thousands but mm -hmm. uh anybody that uh will will sort of get on the wait list now anybody that does that instead of the coming weeks you'll have it before the end of the summer for sure got it yeah. so if you're so a tinkerer you advise somebody who's a tinkerer or who has some technical knowledge to buy it what Absolutely, if it's like my mom or a cousin who's like you know they know how to use their iphone but they're not really good at setting stuff up this is for any smartphone user i mean we have okay. uh, we have made it that made it accessible to okay. everyday people. So the kits won't be the Kickstarter kit. It'll be, you'll pick a scenario. It'll say, like, I want to manage my entryway. Got it. And it will come very prescriptively. And so literally, if you're a smartphone user, you'll be able to figure that out. So, awesome. Absolutely. 
Well, highly recommend everybody um, gets to it. And Thank uh, you. thanks to Kara Swisher and Walt Mossberg for allowing me to do the interviews here and uh, always hosting me at the All Things D conference. Yeah. Highly recommend uh, if you can ever make it to the event doing so. Thanks to our sponsors. Thanks to Brandis for setting up such a great view. And uh, we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Thanks.